Hi, my name's Mary, and I'm going to talk about Git from the inside out. Uh, this talk will be a deep dive into what's going on inside Git. And the main prerequisite is to be comfortable using Git to version control your own projects. Uh, there's an essay version of, of, of all of this, which is uh, just the same content but with uh, in, uh, written in prose. Um, and I also run interactive workshops on this material, um, and so you can email me at uh, this email address for, for more details. The approach of this talk is that, is that Git is a graph, um, and it's the properties of this graph that dictate Git's behavior. And so you can use these properties to reason about what Git has done, what it is doing, and what it will do. So throughout this talk, there'll be slides that are like this with a yellow bar at the top where there'll be some property of the Git graph at the top, um, and then uh, some discussion about the resulting Git behavior. So these are the sort of headlines of this talk. Here's an overview of the, of the talk structure. Uh, we're just going to run a ton of Git commands on a repository, um, and then use the properties of the Git graph to understand how these commands change the repository. Let's start by creating a project. So I'm going to make a directory called alpha, um, and then go into it, so we're now inside the alpha directory. And then I'm going to make a directory inside alpha called data, uh, and I'm going to uh, create a file inside data called letter.txt, and just put the character A into it, so it's just a single character A. Uh, so this is what our project looks like now. It's just the alpha directory, which contains our whole project. Um, and that contains a data directory, which contains a file called letter.txt, which contains the character A. Let's initialize this as a Git repository. Uh, so we can run git init to do that, and git says, hey, yep, I initialized this as a repository. Um, let's look at the file layout of our project again. Um, you can see that we've still got um, our files that we care about, which is our data directory and our letter.txt file. This is known as the working copy in git parlance. Um, but now, after that init, we've also got this .git directory, also in the top of the alpha directory, uh, which contains all of git stuff, so things like the objects directory and, and, and more stuff that we'll see in a second. Let's start by um, adding a new file to git. Um, so just going to run git add data slash letter.txt. Uh, and this tells git about this file. Um, now, uh, when you run add, then, then two things happen. Number one, a blob object gets created. And a blob object just contains the content of the file that you added. So we know that letter contains a. So now there's this blob object thing, which we'll dive into the details of, which also contains the character a. Now, if we look at the .git directory, there's this objects directory, and this contains all of Git's data that it cares about, about our files. Um, we can see that inside objects, there's a, a folder called 2e, and inside that, there's a file called 65. Now, this is all a little bit hard to understand, so let's dive into it. First, we'll start with a quick digression about hashes. Um, now, a hash is a way of taking a long piece of information, like let's say the novel Anna Karenina, a very long piece of text, um, and condensing it down to a much shorter um, string of characters. Git uses hashes of about 40 characters. Um, but what's cool about hashes is that they uniquely identify the text that you use to generate them. So, in theory, only Anna Karenina will produce, when hashed, will produce the hash, whatever it does. Um, uh, whereas, in, in theory, any other piece of text in the entire universe will not ever produce the same hash as Anna Karenina. So you can use these as unique identifiers for much longer pieces of text. And Git uses hashes extensively. Um, it has a command called hash object, which allows you to hash the contents of any file. Um, and so we can hash the contents of letter, which we know contains A, and that gives us back the hash 2e65. Now, like I said, real Git hashes are about 40 characters, but I've shortened them all just to make things a little more readable. So as far as we're concerned, A hashes to 2e65. And so this, this stuff inside the object directory, directory makes a little more sense now. Um, we've got the first part of the hash as the folder name, and the second part of the hash as the file name. Now let's try and look at that file. Um, so we use the Unix cat command, which just prints out the contents of the file at the path that you give it. So this prints out the contents of the 65 file. Um, and unfortunately, it's just uh, you know unreadable nonsense. Um, and that's because Git has encoded it. But 
we can use a, a nice command called cat file, um, which is another git command, which will, you give it a hash, and it gives you back the decoded uh, contents of that object. So the object that we're thinking about is the 2E65 object. So we give it the hash 2E65, and it decodes the contents of that object, which we know is A, back to A. Now step two in doing an add, first step one was adding the blob. Step two is to make an entry in the index. Now what's the index? Well, it's just a file. Um, uh, it's inside the .git directory, as you can see, um, and we can cat it. But unfortunately, again, this is this file is sort of is encoded, and so we can't re very read it very easily just using cat. But instead, we can use a command called git ls files dash s, and all this gives us is um, the, a, a human readable version of the index. Now, the index is just a list of every file that git has been told to version control. Now, we've only told it to version control one file, the letter.txt file. And each entry in the index is the path to the file, so data slash letter.txt, and then the hash of the content of that file at the moment that it was added. So when we added letter.txt, it contained A, and so um, it puts uh, in the index is the hash of A. <clears throat> now to cement these ideas, let's re-add a file to a repository. This is where we're up to so far. Um, on the left, we've got our working copy, which just has one file in it, the letter.txt file. <clears throat> this is the file that we care about, and it contains A. And then on the right, we've got the git index, which has the same stuff in it. It just has an entry for letter.txt, and <clears throat> it points at the hash of the A blob that's stored in the objects directory. This is where we're up to right now. Um, now let's create a new file called data slash uh, number.txt, also living in the data directory. And let's put the string 1234 in it. Um, now we can update our diagram with the with that, so now the working copy has two entries in it. It also has number.txt in it now, which contains one, two, three, four. But the index is has no idea this file exists. Uh, but when we run git add uh, data slash number.txt, we know that two things happen now. We know that the one, two, three, four blob gets created and stored in the objects directory, objects directory, and we also know that an entry is added to the index for this number file, and that entry is pointed at that blob that was created. Um, now let's change number. So um, we're going to change it. It used to have one, two, three, four in it. Now it just has the number one in it. Um, so we update the working copy on the bottom left there to indicate the fact that the working copy has changed. But again, the index oblivious to this change until we run git add. And so we run git add. And now we know that a new blob is created the, the, that contains one. Um, and the uh, end index entry for number.txt is pointed at that new blob. So that's cool. Notice how also the 1234 blob that was stored earlier just happily carries on living in the objects directory. It stays there, everything's fine, it'll just stay there with nobody pointing at it. Now let's make a commit. Uh, so we're going to do git commit dash m uh, for, for a message to, so we can supply a message. And the message we're going to use is a1. So that just represents the fact that a is in letter.txt and 1 is in number.txt. And git says, yep, you committed that to the master branch, and here's the hash of the commit object that git created. Now, let's follow this sort of trail using cat file, so we can, because a bunch of objects have been created inside the objects directory as a result of this commit, and we can just look at them all and just see what they are. So let's start with the, the hash that git gave us back for the commit object, 774b. And so we just cat that file, uh, and we get this stuff. Um, Let's walk through the pieces. There's an author, uh, me. Uh, there's a timestamp um, for when we created the commit. There's a message. Um, and then there's this kind of hard to understand tree thing with, with another hash. So we've got tree and this hash FFE2. So let's, let's use cat file to carry on down looking at these objects inside the objects directory. Um, now, um, the next step of a commit after the commit object has been created is to create a graph of the contents of the index. Now, what does that mean? Well, when we ran git add, we successfully stored the content of the file. So we know that the contents of letter.txt and the contents of number.txt are safely stored in the objects directory. But we also know that there doesn't seem to be a representation of where those files live. So there's no representation of the fact that there's a data directory inside the alpha directory and that that data directory contains two files called letter and number, uh, letter.txt and number.txt, and that those files live inside their data directory and so on. 
So this graph that we're going that the commit creates is what's going to that that is this graph is going to represent um, that fact that, that the content is stored in this structure. So let's see how it's created. Um, so we can cat the hash that was next to the tree uh, string inside that um, commit object. So FFE2. And we get this um, this line here, tree zero ed data. Um, and uh, this it turns out that this tree object represents the contents of the alpha directory, which we know is just the data directory. So we can step through these parts. So it says that, hey, in the alpha directory, there's this tree, uh, which is just and a tree object uh, represents a uh, directory in our in our in our uh, working copy, and a blob object represents the contents of a file. And those are the only main two types of objects that represent content. Um, so, anyways, so we've got this tree object, um, uh, which is uh, called data, um, and it has this hash. Um, and we've added it to our diagram there, so we can see that the a1 commit points at this alpha tree object or the root tree object. Let's carry on down the line. So now let's cat the file uh, associated with the zero EED hash. And now we're getting an idea of, of, we're getting an object that represents the contents of the data directory. So that's pretty cool. So now let's step through these pieces. So we've got this line that says, um, oh, hey, there's a blob. Um, it has the hash 2E65, which you may re remember is the hash of A. Um, and it represents a file called letter.txt. Um, and there it is. We can add it to our diagram. And similarly, there's another line for the number.txt file, which contains uh, one. And so that allows us to, to see that Git has generated a graph of the contents of the index at the moment that we did the commit. So we stored some meta information about the commit, you know, like the timestamp and the committer and the message and so forth. And we also stored the actual content of the commit. And it's now all in there in safely inside the objects directory. Um, next step um, in, in a commit is, is that head uh, comes into the picture. Now, um, what, what's head? Well, head is essentially just a, just a file. It's inside the .git directory. Um, and it represents what branch we're on in Git right now. Um, so if we cat head, it's actually human readable, which is nice. Um, you can see that it contains this ref slash head slash master thing. And master, we, we know that's our main branch. And so, so that makes sense. But what's this ref slash heads, heads business? Um, and that, Makes, it looks like a file path, and actually it is. And so we can cat it. So we can cat dot git slash ref slash head slash master, and we get the hash of the A1 commit again. Remember when we did the A1 commit, then git said, hey, I created a commit with this hash 774b. So that's interesting. So we now know that there's this file called master that contains the hash of the A1 commit. And so we can add that to our diagram. And then if we hop back to head, then we know that a head is pointing at master, which is what tells us we're on the master branch. Now let's, again, to cement that stuff, let's make a commit that's not the first commit. Um, here's where we are after the first commit. We've got this kind of diagram with our head and master, and then our commit object, A1, and then the tree graph that represents the content of our repository at the moment that we committed. We've also got the working copy on the left there that just is our two files, letter and number.txt that contain a and one. We've also got a representation of the index, um, which uh, has also letter and number in it, and they're also in agreement on a and one. That's where we are so far after the first commit. Now let's change number to be two. Um, so we can update the working copy there in the bottom left. Um, and then let's run git add uh, data slash number.txt. Um, and this updates the index, we know. It creates a new blob, which contains two, and updates the index, the number entry for the index, to point at that new blob. So now um, there's this kind of new commit data slowly starting to accrue, but we haven't made a new commit yet. Um, now let's do that commit. So we're going to do the commit A2, and Git says, yep, I committed to master, that was great, and here's the hash of the commit that I created, F0AF. Um, let's walk through those commit steps um, again, um, but this time with this second commit. Um, so number one, make a tree graph of the contents of the index. That goes pretty much as before. Um, notice how data uh, for, the, for the, the new data tree object um, points at the old A blob and the new two blob. That's pretty cool. 
Step two is to create the commit objects. Now um, we can cat the file to have a look at it. The, 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 main, the main difference for this commit object is that um, it has a parent line. Um, and so we can see that the A2 commit on the bottom right there in the diagram um, is pointing at the A1 commit. So again, we can marry that up with, with the line in, inside the commit file where it says parent 774b. And we know 774b is the hash of the A1 commit. So we, see, we can see that A2 points at its parent A1. Next, we point head at the new commit. So this just means that master um, is pointed at A2. Um, now, what have we learned from this? Well, number one, content is stored as trees. Um, and this means that the data, the objects database stores diffs. So notice how the A2 commit has its tree graph, which shares some data, the, the, A1, the, sorry, the A blob, with the A1 commit. So in this way, Git has built right into its core this idea of storing the minimal information needed to store a new version of your repository. So it's super efficient. Next, each commit has a parent, um, which means that a repository can store the history of a project. So A2 has a parent A1, which is the commit that came before it. And by this way, with, with this line, lineage of parents, you can build up the whole history of a repository just with this simple mechanism. Next, refs are entry points to the commit history, um, which means lineages can be given meaningful names. So the A2 commit, we, we've given it the message A2, which is, which is actually a pretty good message for describing what is in that A2 commit, but um, it doesn't really give us a sense of what A2 means as a whole in terms of the whole repository. But a word like, uh, a reference like master tells us that this A2 commit and all that came before it is the latest and greatest in our repository. Next, we've learned that objects are immutable, which means that content is edited, not deleted. So when I added the, when I changed, um, uh, the number file from 1234 to contain 1. Then I ran git add, but the 1234 blob carried on persisting inside the objects directory. And so uh, it's pretty hard to lose data with git, which is really cool. But we've also learned that refs are mutable. So um, this means that a meaning of a ref can change. So though master was pointing at A1, it now points at A2. And there's not really a sort of first class way that git represents that what branches used to point at um, other than um, the history. Um, you can find out, but it's, it's, it's not really exposed at a high level. Now let's check out a commit. And th this is funny because normally we check out branches, but this time we're going to check out a commit and see what happens. So we do git checkout and we give it the hash of the A2 commit. Now this is doubly strange because we're already on the A2 commit. We checked out, we had master checked out a second ago and that was on the A2 commit. So now we're checking out A2 again. So that's strange. And, and Git says head is detached. And that's all that that's all that head is detached means. It means when you've checked out a commit rather than the branch. And we'll kind of solidify that idea in a second. Um, uh, so there's the A2 commit that we just checked out, that we had checked out via master. We've now checked it out directly. Um, now, let's walk through the steps of a checkout to, to see what happens. Uh, number one, we write the commit's content to the working copy. Now, um, there's no work to do here. We were on the A2 commit. We're still in the A2 commit. So the working copy still has A and 2 in it. Uh, similarly, uh, on the uh, step two is write the commit's content to the index. And again, the index, we were on A2. We're still on A2. So the index had A, to, A and 2 in it. And now it still has A and 2 in it. Next step, point head at the thing that was checked out. Now here there is a change. If we cat the head file, we can see that it contains the, the hash of the A2 commit, whereas it used to contain ref slash head slash master. So this is different. This is what it means to have a detached head. Head is pointing directly at a commit rather than pointing at a, at a, at a branch. Um, so in the diagram, this is what that looks like. Notice master still pointing at A2, but head is now also directly pointing at A2, and that's what it means to have a detached head. Let's make a new commit. Let's make the A3 commit. So we change number to be 3, um, and then we add it and commit it as the A3 commit. Um, notice that we're still in the detached head state. Um, here's what that looks like. So notice now head is pointing directly at A3 now. Um, and that's what tells us we're still in a detached head state because head is pointing directly at a commit. Um, now let's create a branch um, to get out of this state. So we're in a slightly worrying state because we've created this new A3 commit, but it's not on a branch. And so while it's all safely stored, 
it would be reasonably easy to let's say come back in a week and then have forgotten that we created the a3 commit and there's no branch pointing at it so there's no clear sign that it exists so we need to get this commit onto a branch and we can do that by creating a branch um, so we do git branch and we're going to call this branch deputy um, and let's go and look at the deputy file now just like master is a file inside ref slash heads so too is deputy and just like master contains a hash, so too deputy contains a hash. And it contains the hash of head at the moment then when we created the branch. Um, so when we uh, were on that branch, then head happened to be pointing at the A3 commit. So now deputy2 points at the A3 commit. And there we are. So now whilst head is still directly pointing at A3, deputy is pointing at A3. And so A3 is safely on a branch. Now what do we learn from this? Well. Number one, branches are just refs, and refs are just files, um, which this, and this means that git branches are very lightweight, and this is what people mean. So when I created that branch, then all that happened under the covers was git went to head, found the hash that head was pointing at, and then created a file and put that hash in that file. So that's super fast, super lightweight. Now let's check out a branch. So this is a little more usual. Uh, second year we checked out a commit. Now we're going to check out a branch. So we do git checkout master and git says, yep, that was fine. I switched to branch master. Um, so here's, uh, let's walk through those steps again. Here's, here's where we started. Um, uh, we, number one, write the commits content to the working copy. Now, this time we were on A3 and we're checking out A2, which means we need to write the content of A2, the A2 commit, to the working copy. So now the working copy contains A and 2 in the top left there. Step two, write the commits content to the index. Again, we were on A3, now we're on A2, so we just set the index to, the, to, to represent the contents of A2, which is, of course, A and 2. Next, we point head at the thing that was checked out. Um, so uh, we point head at master. It was pointing at A3, it's now pointing at master, which means we're now not in a detached head state anymore. We're on a branch. Let's do some merging. Let's merge an ancestor. Uh, we're going to do through go through four types of merge here and this is the first one. So we're going to check out deputy just as uh, just as a preparation. Uh, so now we're on the A3 commit and we're going to merge A2 into A3. Um, so we're on A3, we're going to bring in A2. Um, now we do git merge master when we uh, merge uh, A2 into A3 and git says uh, already up to date which means nothing happened, there's no change we get to make here. Now why is that? Uh, well, a commit is a set of changes, which means that um, if an ancestor is merged into a descendant, git does nothing. Now, what does that mean? Well, way back when we started this, then, then we had nothing. Um, and then we created uh, some files and, and created the A1 commit, which is essentially the A1 commit is a set of changes to go from nothing to our A1 content. And then the A2 commit uh, took us from the A1 commit and added another set of changes to get to A2. And then the A3 commit re represents the set of changes to go from A2 to A3. Now, when we view it like that, then if we're trying to merge A2 into A3, that doesn't really make sense because we're essentially trying to merge a set of changes that we've already incorporated into A3. And that's why merging um, uh, an ancestor into a descendant, merging A2 into A3, does nothing. Now let's merge a descendant, which is the which is the opposite way around of what we've just done. Um, so we're going to check out master just to prep for that. So we're going to go onto the A2 commit. We're going to merge A3 into A2. Um, and we do the merge, and you can see that something does happen. Uh, so it says uh, git merge deputy results in git saying fast forward. So something happened, the merge happened. Let's just see that again. So master was pointing at A2 before the merge, and now well after we merged A3 into A2, master now points at A3 again. Sorry, master now points at A3. Um, so what happens here? Well, let's think about it. Well, again, commits are sets of changes. So to go from uh, nothingness to A1, we produce the A1 commit. Then to go from A1 to A2, then the A2 commit represents the changes to go from A1 to A2. Now, if we are to merge A3 into A2, we're just merging the A3 set of changes into A2, which is fine. So Git totally allows that. But there's already a commit that represents those changes, and that's the A3 commit. So all we have to do in this case is just change what master's pointing to. So it was pointing at A2, and now it just points at the commit that we would like to represent, which is A3. 
and this is called a fast forward merge and that means history has not changed so no new commits were created but um, a reference was changed so commit is a set of changes um, and if a descendant is merged into an ancestor history has not changed but head is changed so head is pointing at master and master gets changed to point to a3 now let's merge two commits from different lineages not quite sure what that means yet but let's let's dive into the details uh, so we're going to make a new uh, commit on uh, master and we're going to change number to be four um, and then we're going to um, add that and commit that as a4 um, so there's the a4 commit um, and then we're going to check out deputy um, and um, uh, change letter from a to b and then commit that to produce the b3 commit so this is the state we're in. This is prior to the merge that we're going to do. So we've got the B3 commit where letter is B and uh, number is 3. And we've got the A4 commit where um, letter is A but number is 4. So the crucial thing to notice here is that one file changed in each commit. So in B3 then letter changed from A to B and in um, A4 then number changed from 3 to 4. So they both had different cha changes to different files and that's crucial for this type of merge. Um, now, commits can share parents, so B3 and A4 both share one parent, A3. Um, and this means that new lineages can be created. So B3 is the start of a new lineage, and A4 is the start of a new lineage. Um, also, commits can have multiple parents, and this is what allows us to do this merge we're about to do. So B4 is the merge commit that we're going to create in a second when we merge. Um, and you can see that B4 has multiple parents, B3 and A4. Um, and this means that allows this means that lineages can be joined with a merge commit. So B4, the merge commit, is joining the B3 lineage and the A4 lineage. Um, let's do the merge. So we do git merge master uh, and we supply a message of B4 for the resulting commit. And the 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 point here is that uh, we're merging A4 into B3, but it really doesn't matter which way around we do these. We're just bringing A4 and B3 together. And Git says merge. Yep, that went fine. Everything everything worked out with the merge. So here's the result. Um, now, what? How do we get that? Well, number one, uh, the first thing is that commits have parents, um, and this means it's possible to find the point at which two lineages diverge. So we've got this B3 lineage and the A4 lineage we can find the point at which they diverge, which is A3, just by walking backwards through B3's ancestors and A4's ancestors until we can find the most recent common ancestor, A3. Um, next thing about the Git graph is that a merge has a base commit. Um, in this case, A3, just which is that most recent common ancestor. And this means that Git can automatically resolve the merge of a file that has changed from the base in only the receiver or the giver. Now, it's a little tricky to understand, but we'll, we're going to walk through the details right now. So, let's walk through the steps of the merge. Step one is generate the diff that combines the changes made by the receiver and the giver. So now our two commits that we care about are B3 and A4. Those are the commits we're bringing together. One of them is the receiver, the commit we're on, and the other is the giver, the commit we're bringing in. We've also got this helper commit, the base commit, which we will use to help us do the merge, the A3 commit. So we generate the diff. So we do one file at a time. So um, letter, um, ch uh, to produce the B3 commit, change from A to B. Uh, but to produce the A4 commit, then letter didn't change at all. It just stayed as A, so A to A. So if we produce the diff that is represented by bringing together just for letter B3 and A4, then it's just, hey, yeah, change letter to B. Easy peasy. Notice that the um, letter file only changed in the receiver. It didn't change in the giver. Likewise, number only changed in the giver, but not the receiver. So this is the crucial thing. As long as the file only changes in either the receiver or the giver, Git can automatically resolve this merge. So here we see that from the base to the receiver for number, it's just three and three, there, no change. But for the base to the giver, it's three to four. So there is a change, so there is a diff. So here the diff is, we would like to change number from three to four. So that's the diff. Step two of a merge is to apply the diff to the working copy, which is really easy. We just change letter to be B to contain B and number to contain four. Next step, step three, apply the diff to the index. Again, just update the index to contain the hashes of B and four. Step four, commit the updated index. Um, we've created the B4 commit there in, in the, on, on the right of the diagram. 
uh, which brings these two commits together, is the merge commit. Notice, though, that it has two parents, b3 and a4, and those are both recorded inside the commit object, inside the object directory. Um, a next point ahead at the new commit. Um, so uh, deputy was pointing at uh, b3, and now it points at b4. That's cool. Now let's merge uh, two commits from different lineages, look just like before, but where the commits both modify the same file. So this is the big difference. Both commits are going to modify number in different ways, and this is going to be the crucial factor that changes the way this merge works. Let's check out master to, pre to prepare, um, and let's merge deputy. And this is just all about uh, doing, it's a quick fast forward merge. This is just all about getting both deputy and master on the same B4 commit. This is just preparatory. Now let's do a little more preparation. Let's check out deputy um, and change number to be five and commit that. And then check out master and change number to be six and commit that. So here again, the crucial thing to notice is that notice that from in the B4, B6, and B5 commits, our three commits we care about, we're going to of course merge B6 and B5 together. B4 is the helper base commit. Um, now, notice that letter is the same in all three commits, but number is different in all three, and that's what is, makes the difference for this type of merge. Um, so we do, the, we do the merge, we do git merge deputy, and unfortunately there's a conflict, uh, which means git pause the merge partway through. It says, hey, there's, I'm sorry, I can't carry on because there's a conflict in data slash number.txt. Let's see how that played out. Step one of a merge, generate the diff that combines the changes made by the receiver and the giver. Now in this case, the receiver is, is B6 and the giver is B5. We're bringing these two commits together. Now letter, super easy story. There's no change. It's the same in the base receiver and giver. So the diff is empty. There's no work to do here. But for the number, it's a bit of a complicated story, unfortunately. Um, because notice that to go from the base to the receiver, from B4 to B6, then we want to change number from 4 to 6. But to go from the base to the giver, to go from B4 to B5, we want to change number from 4 to 5. So what we want to do is we want to change number to be both 6 and 5 on the same line. And that's impossible, and that's why the conflict has occurred. Uh, but we have to march merrily on through the steps of the merge, so we uh, apply the diff to the working copy. And uh, letter, of course, just remains unchanged on B, but number ends up looking like this. Uh, and you may have seen this before if you had a conflicted merge where Git's trying to be helpful here. It's just saying, hey, um, here's the two versions that, 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 that you tried to merge. I don't know how to bring these two together. You've got to sort it out. So it's just given us both versions, six and five. You bring them together, user. Then apply the diff to the index. Um, again, another slightly complicated situation here. This is what the index looked bef like before the merge. It's got an entry for letter, an entry for number, and each one has a hash of the content at the moment that we committed, that, so I'm sorry, at the moment that we added each of those index entries. But I kind of lied to you a little bit, and I said that a index entry was just a file path and a hash. But the lie was there's actually a third important component, and that's the stage. But um, it's been okay so far because the stage has just always been zero in all cases. Um, and zero just means everything's fine with this index entry, there's no conflict. Unfortunately, this is what the index looks like now after the merge. Um, you can see that everything's fine for letter, it's just got a stage of zero, everything's okay, and that's just the hash of B. But unfortunately now number has three entries, it has a hash, I'm sorry, it has an entry which has a stage of one. Uh, which has one hash, and an entry uh, at stage two, which has another hash, an entry of stage three, which has another hash. And those three hashes are just the different versions of number. So one of them is the hash for four, one of them is the hash for five, and the other is the hash for six. And it's the presence of these three entries with three, these three stages, one, two, three, that tells Git that number.txt is in conflict. Um, now, though, it, it, the, at this point, Git just downs tools and says, over to you, please, user. You've got to sort this out. So the user has two things to do, three things to do. Um, they have to resolve the conflicts in the working copy first. Um, and the way they decide to do that is just to set the contents of number to 11. So they add 5 and 6 and they get 11. And that's how they decide to resolve that merge. Um, and so they just type number 11 into, into number.txt. So step four, the user resolves the conflicts in the working copy. Step five, the user resolves the conflicts in the index. Um, and they do that by just doing git add. And git add here is a signal to git to say, yep, I've resolved the conflicts. You can um, deconflict this entry inside the index. 
And so now the index looks like this. Notice letter unchanged, but number now has just one entry. It's stage zero, and that hash is the hash for the content 11. Next, step six, the user commits the merge, and they just come up with a message, B11, and the merge is committed fine. And this is what it looks like. Notice how B11 has two parents again, B6 and B5, um, that it brings together. Now let's remove a file. We're done with merging. Um, so here's where we were after the B11 commit. Um, notice that the working copy has B and 11 in it, uh, two files, and the index has two entries, B and 11 in it. Um, and we're on the B11 commit. We do git rm data slash letter.txt, which says, git, I would like to remove this file from version control, please. And git says, yep, I removed it for you. Um, the result of this is that the file gets deleted from our working copy. So the actual letter.txt file inside the data directory, inside the alpha directory, gets removed from disk. That's step one. And then step two is that the entry gets deleted from the git index. So now you can see that the index only has the um, 11 uh, entry in it for uh, number.txt. Um, then the next step of this, the final step of, the, of a removal is for the user to commit this um, uh, removal as a new commit. And they commit it as the 11 commit. Um, and the way that works is notice how the 11 commit um, still has root and data, but data only contains um, a pointer to the 11 blob. There's now no pointer to the B blob. And that's because the way a commit is created is that git just takes the index, which of course now only has the entry for a uh, number in it, walks it to generate all the trees that are required, um, and then commits that. And so there's just it's just like, essentially, as far as the 11 commit is concerned, the uh, letter file never existed. Now let's copy a repository. And we're going to use the Unix machinery to do this first. We're going to use cp, the Unix command. Um, and we do a recursive copy of alpha to bravo. And all that means is, hey, I would just like to copy the alpha directory to a directory called bravo. And we do that in the in our home directory, um, in this case. Uh, so let's look at what happened. Um, uh, if we just have a look at the contents of our home directory, we can see that um, there's a directory alpha that still exists, that has the working copy in the .git directory, but now newly there's a directory called bravo, which also has the working copy and also a .git directory. So bravo is just a complete copy of alpha. And we're just using, like I say, the Unix machinery to do this. Here's what the alpha and bravo histories look like. They're both on the 11 commit. They've both got everything. Um, now let's connect a repository to another repository. Um, so let's cd back into alpha. Let's go back into the alpha directory. And we're going to say git remote add. Um, and what this means is it's, we're saying to alpha, hey alpha, it turns out that there's a remote that I would like to call bravo that lives here that's very like you. And this, 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 this here is the dot dot slash bravo, which is just a file path um, to the bravo uh, repository, which is just on the same level as alpha. Um, and this shows that we can use local file paths just as easily with Git as we can use SSH URLs or HTTPS URLs or anything like that. So now Alpha knows Bravo exists. And the change that's been made to reflect that is that the config file now has this entry in it that says, and just, again, it's just a human readable thing um, that you can cat um, the config file. And so it says, hey, there's a remote called Bravo and its URL is, is dot dot slash Bravo, where, where Bravo is. Now let's fetch a branch from, from a remote repository. Uh, so we cd into Bravo this time, and we're just going to change number to be 12 and commit, the, commit it to produce the 12 commit. So notice now on the bottom there, Bravo has the 12 commit. Um, Bravo has the 12 commit, but Alpha only has the 11 commit. Now let's cd back into Alpha, and let's do git fetch Bravo master. So we're saying, hey, Alpha, um, we're in alpha, we'd like to bring over the state of master on Bravo. Um, and Git says, yep, I fetched some objects um, over and there's something about a fetch head. So what happened? Well, a few steps to, to a fetch here. Um, number one, uh, find the tip commit on the branch being fetched from the remote repository. Now, what does all that mean? Well, we're fetching master from Bravo, so we want to find the tip commit of master. And the tip commit of master is, is the most recent commit on master. Um, and that's the 12 commit, so indicated with the arrow there on the bottom right. Um, so that's step one, find the tip commit, 12. Step two, copy to the fetching repository, 
repository, which is alpha, the tip commit, and the objects it depends on. So we copy across 12, and any objects it depends on, which might be other commits, but we've actually got all the other commits that it depends on. And actually, but we do need to copy the tree graph and the blob for 12. Step two. Next, step three of a fetch is to point the ref for the remote branch at the fetch commit. So what does this mean? Well, so far all of our refs have been things like, um, all of our branch refs have been things like master and deputy and so forth, that are just the state of branches on our local repository. But now we can see that um, alpha is going to store what, this, what master is doing on Bravo. So it's going to store the state of a branch on a remote repository. And it does that in this remotes directory, um, creates a directory especially for the remote called whatever the remote's called, and then it creates a master file. And that just contains the hash of the 12 commit. So let's update our, 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 our drawings. And we've got the 12 commit, but notice on alpha, master is still pointing at 11, but there's this representation that Bravo's master is pointing at 12. Next, point fetch head at the fetch commit. Um, and fetch head is just another ref um, that points at 12. Um, and you can see that if we cat it, it's just another file, human readable, inside the .git directory. And it just tells, it just records what happened during the last fetch. And in our case, what happened during the last fetch is that master was fetched from Bravo and master had the hash of the 12 commit there. So what have we learned from this? Well, objects can be copied, which means that history can be shared between repositories. Um, so we can share the objects that were in Bravo and copy them straight over to Alpha, and that, that, that works fine. Also, re repositories can store remote refs, which means that a repository can record locally the state of a branch on a remote repository. So Alpha knows what was going on Bravo as of the last time it checked. Now let's merge fetch head. And the way we do that is we just do git merge fetch head, and a fast forward happens. Um, now, this is where we were before merging fetch head. Um, so master on alpha was pointing at 11 um, and fetch head was pointing at 12. Here's where we are afterwards. So we do git merge fetch head and master now points at 12 and it's a fast forward merge which we're familiar with. So before the merge of fetch head, after the merge of fetch head. And this makes sense because um, um, we're just trying to, fetch head just points at the 12 commit. So by saying git merge fetch head, we're, we're effectively saying, hey, please merge the 12 commit into the 11 commit, which results in a fast forward merge and results in pointing master at the 12 commit. Now let's pull a branch from a remote. And we do git pull bravo master and git says already up to date, which means there's no work for it to do here. It's nothing for it to do. And that's because a pull is just a fetch followed by a merge fetch head, which we've just already done. Now let's clone a repository. This is going to have a similar effect to when we create when we CP'd um, Bravo, but we're going to use Git's machinery to do it this time. We're going to do Git clone Alpha Charlie, and that's going to produce the Charlie repository. Let's walk through the steps. So number one, create the directory for the new repository. So create the Charlie directory alongside the Alpha and the Bravo directory. Uh, number two, CD into Charlie, um, uh, the new uh, repository that we're creating. Number three, uh, initialize the clones directory as a git repository. And this is effectively running git in it inside Charlie. So this creates the .git directory and the objects, all the stuff inside it, like the objects directory and so on. Next, step four, check out the branch that was checked out on the repository being cloned. So uh, master was checked out on alpha, so uh, master gets checked out on Charlie. So that's represented by the fact that head contains um, a reference to master. Um, next five, pull the branch that was checked out on the repository being cloned. So again, master was checked out on alpha. So master gets pulled and all associated objects gets pulled over to Charlie. And it's now on the 12 commit on Charlie. Next, let's push a branch to a remote. Um, so to do that, let's cd into alpha. Uh, and let's create another new commit. So we're going to change number to be 13 um, and then commit that as the 13 commit. Let's set Charlie as a remote repository on Alpha. So we do git remote add Charlie to Alpha. So now Alpha knows that the Charlie repository exists. Um, and let's do the push. So let's do uh, git push Charlie master. So um, we're pushing master over to Charlie. And git says, uh, yep, I'm, I'm writing some objects, uh, which seems to go okay. 
Um, so here's where we were before the push. Uh, Alpha had the 13 commit and Charlie only had the 12 commit. And after the push, then Charlie has the 13 commit and associated objects. Notice though that master on Charlie is only pointing at the 12 commit still. Um, but at this point, um, unfortunately, Git downs tools again, and it says, uh, I'm refusing to update the checked out branch because it will make the re repository inconsistent. Um, now, what this means is, uh, is, let's think about it. So imagine I'm working on Charlie, and I'm actually, you know, um, making some changes to files and so forth, and then um, committing them and stuff like that. And let's say I'm partway through making some changes to some files on uh, Charlie. And then suddenly um, someone pushes the 13 commit from alpha to Charlie. Now, some things are going to happen there. First of all, um, some objects are going to come over, which is probably going to be OK, the 13 commit and so forth. But also now, um, if master is going to get updated to point at that 13 commit, then it's going to blow away whatever changes I've been making because to update it, then the working copy needs to be set to the 13 commit. So I'm just going to lose my changes. So Git refuses um, to update a checked out branch via a push. But this doesn't make very much sense because we push to remotes all the time. We push to GitHub. So how does that work? Well, let's clone a bare repository to find out. So to do that, we're just going to cd back to the home directory again. And, and this time, we're going to create the delta uh, repository from alpha again. But we're going to use the dash dash bear flag to say we'd like to create this as a bear repository. And so Git says, yep, cloning into the bear repository delta. Um, to figure out what happened, let, let's, let's look at delta. And this is a little strange, because delta appears to not contain a .git directory. And that's absolutely right. And even stranger, the content, the normal contents of a, of a .git directory have been put in the top level of the delta directory. So this is even stranger. Um, and the, the, what this means is that essentially delta has no working copy. So a bare repository has no working copy. And this means that that problem that, we, that Git just prevented us from, from running into of where we pushed a repository where someone might be working on it, that can't happen anymore because no, there are no working copy files for somebody to work on and potentially lose. Um, and so a bare repository is a sort of clearinghouse for you push to it and you pull from it, but you never commit to it directly. Um, so this will solve our problem. Uh, so here's the alpha and delta repositories. Remember that delta is bare. Um, and they both contain the uh, 13 uh, commit and associated stuff. Um, let's cd into alpha. And let's add delta as a, as a remote to alpha so that now alpha knows about delta as well. Um, and let's create a uh, change number to be 14 and then commit that. Now we've got the 14 commit on alpha, and uh, but still the 13 commit on delta. Uh, then we do git push delta master, and everything seems to go fine now. So we write some objects, and then we see that master gets updated to, to some new commit. Um, so let's walk through that push. First, we copy the pushed branches tip commit and the objects it depends on to the remote repository. So again, we're, we're familiar with this stuff. So 14 gets copied from an associated objects gets copied from alpha to delta. Uh, and then point the pushed branch on the remote to the tip commit. So master on delta gets pointed at the 14 commit. Phew. Well done for making it through. <laughs> So to summarize, Git is a graph, and the properties of this graph dictate Git's behavior. And so you can use these properties to reason about what Git has done, what it is doing, and what it will do. Thank you.